I'm Kai Haley, one of the creators of this series. Um, and for many of you who um, have joined us uh, over the last couple years, we started this, uh, you're familiar with the premise of this series. Um, we started it to create a space for the design community to come together um, and explore the role of design in crafting the future, particularly one that we all want to be a part of. And dreaming um, the topic today can be a powerful tool for doing that. I'm really excited to have Kevin with us, Kevin Bethune. Um, he has an incredibly diverse background, uh, including mechanical engineering, business, and design. Um, and he's going to take us today through his journey and uh, share with us the tools and processes that he has created and uses with enterprises to help them cultivate uh, new capabilities uh, to be able to disrupt and um, shape and form uh, emerging realities. Um, and hopefully, we will all also gain some inspiration and ideas for how we can um, evolve our own careers to be um, future ready. So with that, please join me in welcoming Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, Kai. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Thank you for sacrificing your evening to be with us. I really appreciate that. So again, my name is Kevin Bethune. I'm the founder and chief creative for Dreams Design and Life, a design and innovation think tank down in Redondo Beach, California. Um, I, I should also say that I'm also the board chair for the Design Management Institute, a professional society that I would highly encourage everyone to take a look at. If you want to find out more information, you can go to dmi.org. Um, but again, thank you for this opportunity. It's, it's just great to share just some perspectives with you to hopefully inspire your journeys ahead. We're calling this talk, Design is Dreaming. And honestly, I, I want to encourage everyone to sort of be introspective about your own journeys as we sort of talk this through. I'm going to share a bit of all my different inflection points. And it's kind of been a crazy and wild path. Uh, but it'll be some fun to sort of share that with you. But think about your own sort of dream and your own sort of journey as we, as we talk through. And I think we, we start that off by asking a question. And I want you to kind of do an exercise with me. Um, the first is, I want to ask you, do you still dream? Do you give yourself license to dream? Do you imagine what you could be, what you could achieve, who you could impact, who you could affect in terms of not only yourself, but maybe your family, maybe broader society? Are you asking those questions of yourself regularly? So if you could actually um, bear with me, we, we passed out some pens and paper. I want each of you to just spend a minute to capture your dream, the dream that's on your heart right now. Take a moment, just do a little reflection, and jot down what you believe your dream is at this point in time. There's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> It's your dream. Looks like we're pretty good. Wrapping it up. Got some essays being written right now. <laughs> um, so not to be cliche, but I got to take you back to my very beginnings. And it started, I think, like a lot of us, having an early creative volition. For me, I, I drew for hobby all the time. But I didn't necessarily know what to do with that energy, that creative itch, that creative energy that was happening. Um, I spent the majority of my childhood in the Detroit Downriver uh, region. <laughs> and um, I would say that we were sort of located in the heart of sort of big auto, the big automotive industry. And the paths of engineering and, and business were probably the more celebrated paths. Design was a distant notion, and I didn't, I, I couldn't, there was no way to really fully comprehend what that could mean for me. And because of my affinity for drawing, as well as the intersections with science and mathematics, engineering made the more pragmatic sort of option and choice that was appropriate for me. And so I decided to pursue a degree in mechanical engineering, I attended the University of Notre Dame. And as companies were coming to campus to entertain, you know, the start of our careers, 
uh, the typical engineering pitch was, well, you could come on to the factory floor for a while, maybe work eight to 10 years before we let you do any solid engineering work. And it wasn't necessarily the most inspiring pitch that one could hear. Uh, but there was one industry in particular, the nuclear industry, that had a different message. They were very much facing what I would call a knowledge crisis, and that they hadn't hired young talent for the 10 to 15 years prior before I came out of school. So here you had this wide open door where this industry is looking for people to come in and immediately learn the know-how of what goes into making these, these nuclear power plants and, and making them safe for the general public. Um, an amazing opportunity to walk through that door and engage and, and f feel the mentorship right away to get on, on top of some gnarly problems. So I spent the next five years staring down the barrel of these open <laughs> reactor vessels. So what you're looking at is an actual open reactor vessel with the head, the lid of the reactor set to the side, and the coolant in the system is actually flooding the actual uh, refueling pool, the cavity, that allows us to basically move fuel assemblies in and out of the, the open core. And that water is necessary because it serves as an effective shielding agent to protect us from the harmful <laughs> radiation below, otherwise we would meet our demise if we didn't have that water there. And the fuel actually looks that way when we're refueling. It glows that weird blue. And the work was very um, dangerous. <laughs> um, I would say the environment that we worked in was very militaristic. Everything was on a critical path. And imagine the situation where a plant is up and running for 18 months at a time before it comes down for maintenance. And every day that it's down for maintenance, that's an opportunity cost of a million dollars a day. So if you're done early, you're in trouble. If you're done late, you're in trouble because you're upsetting the critical path scheduling of all these vendors that are trying to get all this work done. So the implications are, are, are rather severe. And this picture to the left is a much younger me. Um, on the left-hand side of the wall, I'm tasked with supervising other engineers and technicians as we're working to refurbish this reactor and incorporate hardware upgrades that will extend the life of the plant another 20 to 30 years. And actually, we built this giant yellow crane. Half of it sits in the water on top of the actual mechanical internals package of the reactor. And the, the top half of the crane sits above the water so that the cranes and rigging allow us to move the right robotics and camera systems and long handle tooling into position to be able to service the parts below. And that metal is screaming with radiation as well because it's been sitting decades next to active uranium. Uh, so it's, it's, again, mission critical work, uh, very dangerous. We had to be very mindful of the, the work that we did. And what this experience taught me was what it meant to actually create great product and build trust and learn how to work with high performing teams at a very high level. Well, through this experience, I would say a natural curiosity for business arose because I was wondering, like, why is the company navigating and making these choices as an engineer? And how do I garner more license for my career than just being expected to execute these engineering sprints over and over again? Um, and so that curiosity for the business acumen that I lacked coming out of college drew me to look, to look into um, pursuing an MBA. So fast forward, navigated through the business school experience. And, and that, that was a two year sort of reset for my career where I was able to take a step back and look at things with a fresh perspective. Mind you, that, that creative itch for my youth was scratching even more because now I had two years of runway to think about my choices moving forward. And I allowed that creative itch to inform the type of companies I would seek come graduation. I could have easily went back to my comfort zone and joined an engineering company with this new business language. But instead, I wanted to join a company that embodied the strategy side, the technological side, but also the creative elements not having any idea of what I would even do with, or what I would even, how I, I would even react to being around those capabilities. But that's where the heartstrings were tugging me. And companies like Nike were at the top of the list at the time of, wow, you, you could find all those facets in that organization. And thankfully, come graduation, they gave me an opportunity to join their fold. I started in the corporate planning group, which was a common destination for post-MBA grads. Uh, moved up to Beaverton, Oregon, worked at World Headquarters, and joined um, the fold where we were looking to really help Nike optimize its financial and operational performance. So this was a great experience to really solidify the language of business in the real life public, 
publicly traded company setting that as Nike, and all the demands that you get from Wall Street, from investor relations, from Nike senior leaders that are trying to understand the performance of the business. Well, the product person within me was kind of going crazy. I mean, that experience was good, but I wanted to figure out where was the cool stuff happening across the Nike organization. Some of you might think spreadsheets are cool, and that's fine, but I wanted, I wanted to go find the product opportunities. And thankfully, um, this sort of collegial environment that was Nike uh, WHQ was very much a coffee chat culture. You would sort of have coffee with some, someone, they would recommend that you go see another person, and the chain kind of continues. And over time, those coffee chats turned into opportunities to actually offer my services to demonstrate that I was really committed to learning and what those product organizations were about. So the stretch assignments were essentially side hustles on top of the day job to garner trust, to show evidence, and to broker relationships. And after about 18 months, I was able to move over to the Global Footwear Product Engine. It wasn't easy because they saw a numbers guy. They didn't care that I was an engineer before. You were a numbers guy. You have an MBA. What? What are you doing over here? Was, was the typical feedback. But one out of every 10 people that I encountered did sort of find interest in what I could potentially offer. And they let me do some things, which is pretty cool. So when I um, entered Global Footwear, I entered in an operational sort of context. And the charter was to help the creative product community figure out more advanced ways to manage their product process, leveraging advanced tool sets to take out a lot of waste, take out a lot of just friction in the process to allow them to focus more time on making better product. And at the time, Nike was very interested in taking some of the philosophies from uh, lean manufacturing and moving those philosophies into the upstream product creation process. So from the span of time between a designer putting pen to paper all the way to the time where we actually you know, confirm a, a sample shoe for mass production, um, that window of time we were introducing new digital tool sets into what was previously a very analog conventional process. The conventional process was very much a designer sketching on a napkin, sending that, sending that sketch to an offshore partner uh, overseas and getting back a sample, and waiting weeks for that sample to come back. That sample was probably 30% correct to the initial design intent. The designer would tape up the sample with masking tape, literally, redraw the lines of what they wanted in the first place, send it back to the offshore partner, wait for another sample. So it was just hard to believe that it would take 18 to 24 months just to get a shoe ready to be merchandised on a store shelf. An incredibly arduous process for any shoe to make it out of the engine <laughs> to, to have a customer enjoy it someday. Um, and what we were then asking the designers to think about was, you can still start with a napkin sketch, but get into the 3D tool sets, lay your design intent on a three-dimensional last, have that inform the tech pack, and ask the factory to execute a sample that's 90% correct to the volition of that 3D asset. And so we could spend less time guessing take out weeks and weeks of friction and high cost, and spend more time finessing the soul, the final details of the product experience. And so you know, to this day, they're proliferating a lot of deep advanced digital creation tool sets to just get the process more close to the insights when it matters. Well, mind you, during this experience, I met all kinds of newfound creative friends that I had never met or seen before. And I became very curious about what they were doing. And my newfound creative friend saw the, the drawings I was doing for hobby outside of work. And a few creative directors basically said, you got a little raw skill. We'll let you, you know, try your hand at footwear design. So the Jordan brand was the first category that gave me a shot. They had too many briefs, not enough resources, not enough designers. And the creative director at the time, his name is Dwayne Edwards, he's like, I'll give you a shot. Uh, you can do a shoe or two under my mentorship. You, um, you basically need to meet me in the morning at 6 a.m. in my studio. We'll commiserate together. I'll show you what you need to do. We'll go do our day jobs. I got a team to manage. You got to go do your thing. <laughs> and then you're going to do my assignment until you're finished at night and come back the next morning. So we worked that way for a better part of a year. And we executed two shoes together. He allowed me to have my designs make it to the store shelves and in the hands of consumers. So the brief that he gave me was a very weird one in that, at the time, Nike was celebrating the anniversaries of two iconic shoes at the same time. 
And they wanted to create these hybrid stories of what you get when you, you match together the iconic Air Force One with the Air Jordan 8 basketball shoe. You couldn't pick two <laughs> remarkably different shoes to try to match together and create a story that was authentic to the, the shoe heritage of both of those stories. So I had to learn the Jordan process of navigating the, the insight collecting, the divergence of all the ideas. These are just a few of the divergent sketches of different ways to combine the iconic heritages of both stories, and then converging on two directions that we wanted to take to market. So we, we agreed to execute a, a mainstream mid-top in regular materials on the right, and on the left, a premium high-end high-top of, of a limited quantity that would be more exclusive and we, we agreed on both of those directions. And because, because we were asking all the Nike categories to adopt all these 3D tool sets and experiment with them, I had to take my own medicine, because I, we were asking them to do it, I had to, do, I had to learn how to do it, and I had to learn the footwear programs to articulate the, the design intent in 3D as well. And we ended up making them. Uh, we executed four colorways in the spring and summer 2010 seasons. They sold really, really well uh, with, with sneakerheads and all kinds of folks. And then we followed up with the high-end version and sold that with limited quantities. So it was a top seller for the Jordan brand for my first hit as, an, <laughs> as a fledgling sneaker designer. And this door led to many more open doors across the Nike uh, portfolio where categories were willing to let me just sort of pick up a brief and try my hand at something. And um, I'm, I'm forever thankful. But, so you can imagine the creative appetite that was now in like a forest fire in my mind of like all the things that are um, exciting about design and innovation and how do I get even deeper in this work. Um, su super, super thankful for that. But beyond that, outside of Nike's berm, outside of the world headquarters, the world was changing too. I mean, no better place in Silicon Valley than to exemplify the change that was happening with the advent of mobile technologies, this multidisciplinary convergence that was brewing, and you're starting to see design celebrated on the cover of business magazines, um, organizations, artists, and media producing these commentaries around like the value and the power of design. Highly recommend you see Objectified if you haven't already. Um, an amazing body of work to just continue to fuel and fire up my curiosity for design. And what was brewing for me was this convergence that I started to see a little bit of myself in and I wanted to continue to sort of hone that. But I had to be a bit honest with myself and say, you know, with the engineering and business legs of the stool sort of rationalized, a few shoe projects wasn't going to necessarily answer the design leg of the stool. I had to go deeper. I had to be more mindful. And I, I was facing a choice, honestly, a big fork in the road. I could continue to claw and scratch in the Nike environment for another 10 years with shoe, side hustle shoe projects before perhaps they would credential me as an esteemed footwear designer. Or I could perhaps think bigger than just shoes and say, you know what, I want to build out my creative toolkit, my creative foundation more robustly and really position myself at the intersection of this Venn diagram and work on innovation for the rest of my career. So this was the bigger dream that was coming to fruition for me. And around that time, I was looking at schools. I thought I was done with school. My, my mentors and friends said, you're done with school. Why are you thinking about going back to school? But as you're experimenting and in, in, you know, shoe projects like this and I want this. Like it, it becomes like you've become so hungry that you just want to fulfill on it. And upon navigating the Nike network, I met a lot of alums from Art Center College of Design. And I found myself really gravitating to the ethos of what the school represented. So thankfully applied, was able to get accepted and packed up the house in Beaverton, Oregon, and moved down to LA to begin another chapter of graduate study at this institution. And the, re the real <laughs> heroes of this story are my wife and son. Uh, my son wasn't even one yet when we decided to pack up and, <laughs> sorry. sorry about the emotion. Um, but they're, they're the true heroes of the story to be able to see this dream and, and encourage me to go, to, to really go for it. And, um, it was, it was just a qu quite fascinating inflection point in my life. 
and one that I hope inspires my son for the, you know, for the rest of his life. But anyway, <laughs> um, Art Center had very much gone through a metamorphosis around the same time too. So serendipity through the story was quite constantly my friend. Art Center had uh, sort of changed from this sort of purist position. You had to come from design historically to participate in the graduate programs at Art Center. But with my cohort of applicant, they opened the aperture. They were willing to entertain other disciplines in the mix. So my cohort of student as we were entering in, I was joined by folks that had come from places like uh, Coca-Cola marketing. Like one guy was a marketing director for Coca-Cola in Europe. Another, another person had traversed Harvard, their, their Harvard Medical School sort of program two to three years in and decided to pivot and change the medical arena through design and not continue to be a surgeon. He saw more effectiveness of going that angle. So he pivoted and restarted his graduate education. So this was the cohort of 14 of us that were sort of mired together with all of our visions and big dreams, and we, we rationalized our way through the program. And it was half industrial design practicum, but it was also half venturing. Like how do you leverage your design capability to provoke a venture opportunity and speak to the desirability, the viability, and the feasibility of a new innovation and, and actually go build it? So that, that was sort of the school of thought. And this notion of designer as entrepreneur was becoming front and center. And as I was rounding the final semesters, wondering if, <laughs> if a full-time job would be waiting on the other side of this experience, especially after such a big career gamble of leaving a place like Nike, um, that, that, that volition to want to be helpful, I was freelancing for, for uh, ventures and entrepreneurs around the LA area. And that networking and that work brought me in front of a small handful of players that have come from long histories in the management consulting and private equity spaces. They knew all too well the perils of Waterfall where big enterprises work with perhaps a strategy firm for a while, then they hand off the ideas to a design firm for a while to flesh out the experience, then they hand off the idea to an implementer. It might be a couple of years before you even see a prototype in market for a lot of big companies. That's, that's proverbial Waterfall. But I'm, I'm preaching to the choir within Silicon Valley in that there's a startup audacity that we wanted to help large companies begin to garner. And so our thesis as we met each other was, well, why don't we just get the disciplines sitting around the table from day one, have that team get to an integrated vision much faster, and then have that same team just go build the offering, go build the solution, go build the, the, the business around the solution, and get in market as fast as possible so we learn. And so our efforts, we helped a few large companies in their Rolodex, created a lot of value quickly, and we garnered the attention of some very big players in the management consulting space. Booz and Company was the first global platform to take a bet on our small team. We created a lot of value very quickly for them, for their clients. Uh, 10 months into the journey with them, they got absorbed by PricewaterhouseCoopers, and it wasn't necessarily the right fit for our maker group. And so we started pursuing our options. So BCG watched all this happening, the Boston Consulting Group, and they invited us into their fold. And they said, you know what? You guys have demonstrated product market fit already. We're very excited. Let us know what you need. And that's what they did. So they brought us on board. We were called BCG Digital Ventures, a wholly owned subsidiary. And we were a new venture platform for this very established, esteemed management consulting group. And we were a bunch of makers coming into a management consulting party trying to understand. <laughs> but based on our learnings prior, we knew what to ask for. We said, we're actually not going to join BCG teams out in the field at the client site and just join a BCG case. We're makers. We have a different way of working. So instead, we need to have you invest in us by building innovation studios strategically located around the world where we ask the clients to come live in residence with our multidisciplinary teams. And so it was a much different way of working. And to give you a sense of the space that we created, we worked with a very bold architect to rationalize venture spaces for these teams, these multidisciplinary teams, to be able to function the way they need to function, like true startups. And we asked every, every client to send three to five of their people to join that team and live in residence for the next many months, if not over a year, before they actually cooked the business and spun out the business, either in a, J, uh, in a JV scenario, joint venture scenario, or 
perhaps as a new business unit that eventually gets plugged back into the larger client enterprise. So we had to create spaces for our new experts that are a part of this platform. So giving designers a village to be able to rub elbows with fellow designers and share best practices was very important. Allowing coders to code and engineers to do their thing in the right modalities that made sense for each expert. And because BCG was so hypothesis first in their problem solving approach, we had to carve space and push on the walls to say, you know what? We have different experts that need to problem solve in different ways. Perhaps there's a deductive or inductive way of problem solving that we need to appreciate. And we need to give these experts the space to function and thrive. So in essence, we were turning this theory, this utopian notion of the multidisciplinary Venn diagram, we were living it by reality. I mean, my time coming through Nike, this was the exception, not the rule. Most com large companies, this is the exception. Very few people get to work this way. We got to wire ourselves to work this way all the time, which was really fascinating. But it wasn't easy because when you bring these different disciplines together, we had to be conscious of all the baggage that each person was bringing into this very new platform with a very new environment surrounding the, the, the teams. And we have to look at the historics of where each of these folks are coming from when they form a venture team. The business side, um, the conventional disciplines of strategy, marketing, finance, They've commanded a lion's share of influence in the, how enterprises are managed, how, how enterprises are strategically oriented for their future trajectory. Um, to technology, maybe to a lesser extent. And here in, in the Bay Area, you know, we see a lot of engineering-led companies. Uh, and that's a good thing, right? And there's familiarity at a large corporate level with a lot of technological platforms and, and um, key you know, intellectual property, but there might not be as much familiarity with some of the fringe technologies coming over the horizon, like blockchain or deep learning or some of the more advanced uh, things that are yet to be commercialized fully. But design, I think, has uh, faced a beleaguered set of misperceptions and, and, and misnomers around its value. For large enterprises, unfortunately, there's still the stigma of it being the last step in the value chain. All the good thinking was done. Please put beautiful form around the function that I thought of in advance. Putting lipstick on a pig, I mean, some of these, <laughs> these notions that we're familiar with. And then when it comes to design, like what type of design do we need? And the lack of understanding definitely feeds into this misperception of design being a fragmented notion. I, I honestly believe this audience knows the value of design. Uh, but you, you know as well as I do that it takes a tremendous amount of educating and advocacy to make sure that design has that seat at the strategy table. And it takes a lot of energy to keep that seat once you get it. <laughs> uh, so you know, building community, build, building trust, showing evidence are all parts of the equation. And so we had to work hard to get those venture teams to build their chemistry so that we could actually unlock the intersection of overlap. And because we brought the client into the party, they were living literally in residence with us now this venture team starts to take on a unique advantage. We had them basically connected to a larger client enterprise, and now that venture team could actually leverage scale. They could leverage the subject matter expertise of that larger client. They could leverage the distribution channels. They could leverage their brand. And for a new venture, we might create a sub-brand that keys off the parent brand. And all of a sudden, we're garnering this corporate partner alignment, which is quite interesting. That we can leverage the assets that inform the core of the client and have that be a unique advantage compared to a startup being birthed out of a garage, let's say. So, you know, a very, a very cool sort of experience to, to sort of witness. Um, and I think that multidisciplinary teaming allowed us to show up to the marketplace differently. If we compare that to a, a strategy team going out into the field to engage a market opportunity, they might come in with a, a research plan to do a bunch of focus groups and surveys to get data, right? But for us, we could show up very differently. So if we want to provoke this notion of pet healthcare and well-being for your pets and engage pet parents, we could actually make a prototype within days and come out and engage people and, and, and really test attitudes and have honest conversations with them and co-create a better answer than what we provoked in this prototype. And I promise you no pets were harmed in the making of said wearable. <laughs> Another, another fun um, 
venture that was one of my favorites to witness was one that came out of our Berlin Innovation Center. Bosch Engineering came to us with a curiosity around, how do I get into mobility? That was it. That was the hypothetical question that we needed to, to wrestle with. And again, we, 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 we ring-fenced the multidisciplinary team. We gave them the right nutrients. We gave them a methodology to follow. They trusted the process. And they diverged all kinds of wild ideas and converged on this e-scooter sharing platform called Coop. So they've since deployed thousands of scooters across four major European cities where all you need to do is actually pair, pair to a scooter with a normal driver's license. You don't have to worry about parking because you can park a scooter on the sidewalk. It's not illegal to do so. Creating very simple mobility for the, the modern urban you know, commuter. And um, it was just a, a fun experience. And that, that business actually spun out. It's operating on its own. It's, a, it's another joint venture where all stakeholders are enjoying the financial upside of this business. So this, isn't like, this wasn't theory. This was creating a, a real business that had to function, bless you, and creating value for all the stakeholders that believed in the mission. Meanwhile, we were, we, we were juggling, like let's say, five of these at first, then 10, then 50, then 70, on the order of 70 new ventures at any given time at various stages of incubation. And the question was, well, what, is my, what was my role in that, that soup of multidisciplinary recipe that we had created? I was tasked to serve as the vice president of strategic design. And so every venture got a couple strategic designers to join the fold to really manage the creative navigation of that team through the creative process and approaches, and also to go deep where necessary, whether it was ethnographic research or industrial design of a you know, device. And we would team quite closely with experienced designers that, come, that came from the digital UX UI side of the coin. So what was strategic design? For us, it meant the study of human behavior in context and the design of holistic solutions aimed to satisfy those latent unmet needs that we discovered in the marketplace. How? We really doubled down on finding those implicits, those latent sort of attitudes, behaviors, motivations, the thick substance that we needed to, to garner to be able to craft a transformative solution. And design thinking was especially helpful for us to, to bring those insights together and to get the team mobilized around the right things. And honestly, for our design, for, for every designer on the venture team, the, the true task of courage that we would, we, we, would, we would ask of them, that we would empower them to follow, was to just have them recognize that the, the venture teams, the, the relationship holders, may not know what to necessarily ask for from you as the designer on that multidisciplinary team. Everyone's learning how to work together, right? So by charter to them, as designers, you need to make sure that you're looking for those moments, whether it be a journey or a system, you're finding those moments where your stakeholders, no matter if it's B to B, B to C, B to B to B to C, <laughs> you're finding those moments where you're creating new utility for someone to naturally take a step forward in their user experience on their terms, that we're not pushing solutions on top of them or pushing solutions in search for home. We understand the need and we're saying, create that new avenue of intuitive utility. And in a world of big data, with information impinging on us from all, all in every direction, how do we as designers help parse through the noise and surface up information that's relevant for that person to naturally want to take a step forward in their terms in their user experience? And then lastly, how do we do more than just solve the incremental pain points that we discover, but how do we actually elevate the promise and change how someone feels when they engage a particular brand? Change the whole mind frame of how they feel about the brand of which they're engaging, and they want to come back for more. That was, that was the true spirit of what we wanted every designer to show creative confidence and creative courage to go find those moments. And if you did that well in a particular moment in the journey, we, we tended to call those moments moments of truth. And if you do it really well, maybe you can make a business out of that one moment of truth, and everyone's happy. <laughs> so it begs the question, what does the multidisciplinary team give you? I honestly believe that it, the, 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 the teaming and collaboration inform where future innovation is going to come from. The more things converge, the collaboration is the, the, the true secret sauce of what's going to fuel future innovation. And how does that team do that? Well, 
it can look to the future differently. If we look to the future through this proverbial lens, if this is a lens staring at the distant time horizon, we can have that team see the future through a number of different vantage points. They can see the future through the lens of people, industry, trends, and exemplars. And I'll talk through each. We start with people. Every engagement that we encountered, there was already reams of conclusive evidence, research, research on audiences, segmentation, uh, market size, size of the prize, all the different uh, quantifications you can imagine. And this was typically the modality where you know, strategy teams would evoke focus groups and surveys to collect that type of information. And we had to be careful to ensure that the information that we did have wasn't already expired because consumer movements were changing every six months. But for us, it meant getting outside of ourselves to find the stuff that was truly missing. And it meant getting out there with the people and not treating them as research subjects behind a mirrored glass, but engaging them honestly in a co-creative, collaborative manner. And doing a number of open source techniques to try different things to create together as a participant, as a collaboration, not as a research study that you're, you're in this box and I'm studying you and quantifying you. It had to go much deeper than that. So whether it was shop alongs or generative exercises or affinity mapping or shadowing the expert who's serving their end consumer, we, we, we navigated hundreds of different research techniques, investigation techniques, to make sure that we were being thoughtful to design the right research approach before we got started in our work. And one rubric that's helpful is sort of the inverted triangles where usually we had a lot of the, the bottom stuff with a large sample size. We had statistically significant conclusive data that is absolutely still necessary to inform strategy and prioritization. Think of that as the framing, almost like in an archeological dig, you have the framed kind of uh, areas. So where do you dig? The, the upper region was often what was missing 90% of the time. Like, what do people really care about? We need to go find that stuff. It isn't the conclusive answer. It's something different that we need to shape. So usually it, it, it required picking a smaller subset of people and spending a lot more time with them, whether it's days in their environment or you know, 60 to 90 uh, minute one-on-one -on -one conversation with them to truly understand attitudes, motivations, behaviors, aspirations, the contradictions between concrete and their future ambitions. Like we, we really tried to mine into that stuff. And over time, the team would distill what we called value criteria. What are the things that each constituent in the ecosystem cares about truly? And in this case, this is a, a restaurant chain example where you can imagine the end consumer, that person wants to feel satisfied. And if you do it repeatedly, they're going to come back and be a consistent sort of uh, patron with you and maybe even engage in your loyalty programs. But in the world of mobile tech, we have to be careful of what data we're asking from people and ensuring that we're giving them a, a, a value in return and walking a delicate dance of give and get and not overstepping our bounds, right? And they're not alone in the ecosystem. There's a, a person serving them in the restaurant. That, that stakeholder is caring about other things. They want to feel like they are empowered to do a good day's work. They want to feel like they can enjoy some of the spoils of a good day's labor through incentives. And they want to feel like they found the job, or I'm sorry, they, they want to feel like they left the job better than when they, they found it through appropriate professional development. They walked away from the job that they had better. And they're not alone. We have the restaurateur, the, the person owning the restaurant, or perhaps a chain of restaurants who's worried about strategy, building right culture, and empowering their workforce by investing in the right capabilities. So what's the system of concern across stakeholders? We need to map that and understand that. And a lot of these elements are sort of human value criteria that may remain steady over the course of time, but some of them might change based on how trends and movements impinge on each of them. If we take data privacy as an example, that's changed remarkably over the last handful of years. Um, five years ago, it would be awkward to ask, like, can I know your location? And now we take it for granted with every app that we consume. Let's talk about industry. Um, when, we, when we engage a particular industry, it's all too easy to sort of just lean into the present consensus of how that industry is supposed to behave. That's just the way this industry is. That's the way healthcare is. That's the way consumer products are. 
deal with it, you know, align to what the, the constraints are. But as designers, I think we have an opportunity to better question what's going on. One useful tool that hopefully a lot of us are familiar with is the business model canvas by the strategizer folks, which allows someone to come into a new situation, look at a business model, existing or new, and break down the piece parts, the elemental pieces and foundational principles that make it run. And we can start to ask questions, like why does it have to be that way? Is there something that we can do to swap out an assumption and disrupt, create opportunities for disruption? But if your Twitter feed is anything like mine, there's a lot of questions being asked of large enterprises around ethics, transparency, corporate responsibility, sustainability. What's right? What's the more broader reaching impact of some of these business decisions? So a friend of mine by the name of Craig Walmsley, he's a, a head in uh, design strategy at Publicis Sapient. He actually sort of reconfigured this canvas and he created what he calls an impact canvas where we're still rationalizing the same business and customer aspects, but now we're questioning, what is the impact of that employee's work having on his or her family? What is the data privacy issues creating in terms of ethical challenges? How is our business model um, exploiting or diminishing resources? How do, we, how do we rationalize some of these bigger implications ethically and actually have conversations where we're, again, asking more questions? And through that push, that provocation, our ability to ask the right questions creates opportunities for disruption. And being able, on top of that, to proactively navigate the disruption and not feeling like you're reacting to it. And this is where dreaming plays in because your dreams inspire the professional conviction to actually challenge these models. A fun example from my shoe days, you know, again, the, the tooling required to create these midsoles and outsoles is very, very expensive, energy intensive, costly. If you get a design line wrong, imagine having to scrap that hunk of steel to recreate another mold. And, and imagine how the customer attitude is changing. Customers want to customize, they want to personalize their offerings. They don't want to just take whatever's on the store shelf. So how do you enable that when this stuff is so expensive and so energy intensive? Well, if we question that input of the cost and time associated, is there another technology that could come in and disrupt that assumption? So leveraging things like 3D printing to print temporary nylon molds that could print a few thousand runs of product you know, for the cheap. That definitely now opens up long tail possibilities to tap into where the customer wants to go when it comes to customization and personalization. So the iceberg analogy sort of rings true. You could take it as a given if you just only look at the surface, but if you go deep and really question the, the first principles that are at play, the, the whole iceberg could flip on its head. Trends. Trends as a vantage point, oftentimes when we hear the word trend, our minds go to technology typically. And you know, CES is one annual anecdote in January. <laughs> All the big brands are showcasing their perspectives on the role of machine learning, deep learning, 5G, and what that's going to provide us. Um, connected, sorry, connected um, hardware and the pervasiveness of, of these devices now seamlessly talking to one another. Very exciting stuff. But I, as I navigate those hallways, I often question, OK, what's the human imperative out of all this? What will this mean for real people and real contexts? So my encouragement is when we think about trends and we talk about trends, that we go more holistic in how we collect trends. So one acronym that is quite helpful is the STEEP acronym. Um, so STEEP basically talks about, like, let's, let's encourage ourselves to collect the full gamut of trends across social, technological, economic, environmental, political, regulatory, and legal and energy-related trends that are affecting our space. There's no space not being affected by these major categories. And there could be more categories, that's the plus. In the case of healthcare, there might be delivery model trends. So delivery could be a D on the end of steeped. Um, and we curate those trends accordingly. And as we're looking for signals, reading articles, following luminaries, looking at research, looking at startups, all those things are informing a distillation of what we believe the important trends are for our topic that we're focused on. And we try to synthesize those trends as, as gradients, as vectors of change. Something's rising, something's increasing, something is fanning out. 
and we, we try to give it that color because it's going to definitely guide how we leverage these trends in our problem solving. On top of the steep rubric, there's also the school of thought around this notion of renewal. So any new innovation that comes on the scene, and this is based on the work of Jeffrey Williams out of Carnegie Mellon, but basically every, every new offering goes through a period where it comes on the scene, there's a lot of excitement as we all see, but usually there's a lot of trial and tribulation and early adoption, so then there's a period of disillusionment. There's usually a dip where people are like, ah, oh, this, this sucks, it's never gonna <laughs> happen. But someone does eventually figure it out, the adoption starts to happen, and we start to see scale. And over time, something else comes into the picture which challenges the, the previous offering, and so that offering matures and eventually retires for the new thing that comes in its stead. And every industry has what we call these economic time cycles. So for consumer tech, we might see innovation cycling every six months on a very fast clip. But if you're in chemicals or paper making, insurance or even nuclear, some of those cycles take years before something else is ready to come in. And when we talk about innovation and future world building, like what timing are we talking about? How are the variables lining up in a perfect constellation to ensure a greater probability that that innovation is going to be successful? So timing is especially critical when we think about, is this really ready for game time or are we too early? And being honest about that in our future forecasts. Taking it even further, there's this notion of a probability funnel. As we forecast ourselves out in time beyond today, what do the next 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 years look like? And we can look at recent movements and trends to evoke a, more, a most likely path that's ahead of us and, and paint that future world. But as designers, we have to use our dreams to imagine more divergent possibilities than just that. We need to expand our imagination into the possible and even the plausible, even rub up against the, the boundary of science fiction to say, like, what alternative future landscapes can we model out to provide new canvases for designed experiences? And we can start to play games with all these like, frameworks, right? We can actually take two trend vectors that we believe are going to be highly impactful and cross-pollinate them together. In the case of healthcare, I might cross-pollinate the, the, the gradient between stationary practices and practices moving to the point of care as mobile solutions with how general or specialized the care is going to be in the future. And just by cross-pollinating those two trend vectors, I just created four quadrants or four future worlds that we could contextualize. And this is not about consulting two by twos. I promise you there will, there will be no data line running through this. We can actually add color. We can throw paint in each of those quadrants. We can bring to life a world. We, could, we can imagine personas, we can imagine business models, we can uh, imagine supply chains, disruptions happening in each of those quadrants. And we can keep going, we can keep cross-pollinating and creating multiple future worlds. And we should, as, as designers leading that future um, imagination. And the picture shows you an example where we took a C-level leadership group through this exercise, and together we provoked 30 worlds with them in a day. And what was interesting at the end we had them take a step back and say, let's vote on the worlds that you want to see your brand living in in 10 years. And they voted on six of those 30 future worlds. And that evoked a whole rich conversation around, actually, you know what? Those six worlds that we picked inform the capabilities that we can invest in today to prepare for an uncertain future. An uncertain future that's variant, that has these wide possibilities, but at least we know we want to ring fence, ring fence ourselves to live in this region over here. So very, very powerful stuff if we commit to it and, and trust the process. Lastly, exemplars, the last vantage point. Exemplars are purely the living embodiments of those trends taking flight. Uh, I follow luminaries as one example. I follow the work of John Maida and, and Mary Meeker. I love their annual reports where they espouse predictions, they question uh, uncertainty, they, they surface some wild cards that we need to consider, and all those things are useful tools to allow us to synthesize compelling vectors of change. Research groups are also exciting. So the work of you know, MIT Media Lab or Stanford, I mean, this, in this case, like wearables, what could wearables do? And they're, they're prototyping things that are five to seven years out and provoking like, the future of what clothing could, could do for us moving forward. So if your scarf were to change, if you're taking a phone call, or your sweater taps you on the, the arm to tell you to move left when you're walking down the street. All very interesting stuff. 
And then there's something to be said for, putting your, for, for getting yourself out there and engaging with people beyond your immediate company walls. So engaging in conferences, following your peers in similar topic areas, but perhaps in different industries is also quite helpful. Following startups, following the deal flow, the flow of money, give insight to, to where things are emerging that can inspire your work. So what do we do with all this stuff that we've conjured up? Multidisciplinary team, all these insights flying around, what do you do with it? Design thinking has been especially helpful to allow us to guide the whole multidisciplinary team through that experience of what a creative typically goes through. Where we discover the extremes and we converge on an opportunity set and we ideate all the possibilities for a while before locking in on the thing that we want to go build. And I typically dislike presenting such a clean, linear picture of the process. We know that's not true, <laughs> typically. It tends to look more like this. Uh, this is a sketch that I made on the plane a couple years ago where there's a lot of just chaos and anxiety when you in start any innovation opportunity. It's like, oh, the margin I've been enjoying in my core is sort of running out. I'm worried about disruption because I have a competitive threat moving at 10 times the speed. And oh, by the way, I need to find new sources of gross margin growth to inform my profitability moving forward. And I need an innovation capability that gives me new ideas for growth. But also with that, the bottom half, we have a core business that we need to be mindful of, a core business that we need to keep alive <laughs> and sustaining the entire mothership. And we need to constantly renew that core asset as well. So the idea flow between the innovation capability and the core business is very important to nurture. So as designers, like where are we in the soup, right? It's very important to understand where you are so that your work can have the right impact. And for us, it wasn't enough to just put an iteration on the wall and call it good. We had to explain the human-centered guiding principles and technological imperatives that were informing that iteration. And that wasn't enough in this world. Where are we? Where are we in the process? And what feedback is critical for that group to sort of give up and share so that the designer can go take another iteration? And if we get that wrong, we're wasting a lot of time because we're, our objectives and imperatives are misplaced. So through that experience, I started feeling this growing concern and I'm, mind you, I'm tasked to you know, lead a growing cohort of designers across each of these different ventures. And I became very worried about the designer's experience. Even though like, we had a lot of ventures doing great things, creating great businesses, but sometimes the perception of design in a multidisciplinary setting is, oh, they're the ones that are naturally good at the post-it notes. They're naturally good on the whiteboard. They're imagining and they're using our visual language to move the team forward. And that, you know, we, we don't mind doing those things. Those are necessary things to move teams forward that we are innately pretty good at inherently. But as we know, there's a lot of deep work that has to happen outside of the team brainstorm, at your desk, out in the field. There's a lot of deep work. And I started to write articles about that very thing. And I shined a light on like, where, where are designers actually practicing deep empathy and codifying that empathy in terms of how products are architected and really establishing the right guiding principles from, from the jump? Or, or how are we actually you know, mimicking someone and following through in their shoes and ex actually experiencing the end person's realities by doing it too and calibrating our senses of how we can better design for their needs? Or how are we tapping into philosophies that might exist in the humanities outside of design and ethical places, um, like tapping into philosophies like flow uh, tapping into Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's work and how do we help people find their notion of flow to unlock their human potential and experience? And how do we look at all the different faculties of ingredients that are out there to design with? Uh, Kai and I were talking earlier about this case study she shared around you know, this, the, the notion of designing for the, the sound of your car when you step in and all the different audio triggers that you get when you enter a car. Like These are all these ingredients that we have to be mindful of. Human beings are very sensorial, physical, tactile beings. And we're, we, we can't only focus on the interactions that are happening through rectangular viewports. We have to consider the full breadth of ingredients when we design against the latent friction that we find in the market. So these are the things I started writing about. And then I was ultimately invited to share that message on the TED stage at a TED event in Milan in partnership with BCG. So I shared what we call the four superpowers of design 
you, you can easily Google it, Four Superpowers of Design, and sort of feel out those case studies that we shared um, to get a sense of, you know, it's not about the design thinking teaming kumbaya sort of message. It's, no, that's good and all, but we need to create space and room for us to go deep as experts and bring a really good idea back to the team room that can really galvanize and accelerate the team beyond just the brainstorm. And that conviction, that's those sets of convictions, attracted more sort of side hustle opportunities outside of my BCG DV day job, where entrepreneurs would reach out and say, hey, can you help me? Kevin, I like your perspective on this. I don't necessarily want <laughs> all of BCG's you know, platform. I want just your singular voice. Can you help me out with my product? And there, those opportunities started coming up more and more again. And it made me kind of question, there's an opportunity here to maybe hang my own shingle and start my own platform around these tenants that I'm starting to believe more and more in. And so April of last year, I decided to leave my BCG job and start my company called Dreams Design and Life. And really the, the play on branding is that the, the dreams are critical for us to imagine new possibilities. Design is the medium to bring our visions into reality. And life appreciates the, con the, the concretes, the constraints, where we need to understand and empathize and show compassion to design the right things for the people based on their true authentic needs. And so that's the sort of the continuum that has informed the brand. And in terms of how you know, we engage, it's all about breadth and depth. It's not about like a big platform play where you're forced to like absorb all this stuff. It's like how can we just begin problem solving together and being thoughtful around the opportunity and go wide with certain capabilities to bring people in in a multidisciplinary sense but also go deep once we identify the big nuggets of work that are required and ensure that we're being very thoughtful in that work. And taking some shared risk and reward in how we arrange those relationships. So that's what my firm is focused on. It's not about just entertaining any idea and opportunity out there. I want to collaborate with the right people. I want my company to collaborate with the right people. So I'm very slow in the, in the business development of those relationships. One example that uh, venture that I'm personally invested in as a co-founder, uh, investor, and contributor. I contributed the industrial design for this one. It's a, it's a blockchain uh, venture called Kivo. And we're looking at the space of those early adopters who are starting to invest more seriously in cryptocurrencies. And there's some, you know, there's some offerings on the market right now to allow someone to perform a air-gapped sort of transaction and record of their cr crypto assets while not leaving it to some marketplace to get hacked. <laughs> so these devices are starting to become popular. But they're very arduous. You have to manage uh, manual seed phrases. You have to have complicated passwords and keys. And if you make a mistake, it's really easy to just mess up your whole <laughs> asset mix and, and regret the choices that you've made. <laughs> so as a, as a collective, as now it's like 15 of us that we're working together. Um, we diverged all the different possibilities of form factor, digital interaction, user behavior, uh, and eventually sort of converged on this better mousetrap where we're creating a device that offers multi-factor authentication. And essentially, the device records a mirrored copy of that information, that, crypt that crypto information, onto the carbon key. And you send that carbon key back to Kivo who then works with a third party to put that carbon key in cold storage, much like a security uh, safe deposit box. So if you were to ever lose this device, you get your carbon key back, you get a new device, and you're immediately up and running. You don't have to worry about like, all, the, all the manual friction that's involved in the, the, the current incarnations of offerings. And it's, we had to think about the form factor, too. It had to look like something that was more serious than a USB like stick drive that could break in your bag or get lost. You were talking about investors that are investing serious money in their crypto assets. So they needed a device to match the, the emotion of that investment. And it's more than just the device. We're thinking about the ecosystem. So how do we create a future world where we take crypto investing and make it as user friendly as a savings account at your regular bank? So we're looking at beneficiary services of how do you like, pass on your assets to a loved one. Um, we're looking at extensive coin support for multiple coins. And we, of course, the cold storage service that I mentioned to store your carbon key 
to get restored. So it's about the full ecosystem play for this offering. And we're taking pre-orders, and we're going to come to market with it at the end of this year. It boils down to the, the story that we're trying to tell. And the systematic elements that need to come together to really support that story, to, to bring it forward to its fullest potential. Now, I'm going to pause here and say that if you've internalized sort of how your journey has played out and, and sort of followed along the different analogs of lessons that have been sort of shared, I'm quick to say that I would be lying if I told you that those inflection points that I've encountered were part of some master plan. It clearly was not the case. I would be lying if I said that. Serendipity was a friend, very blessed, very grateful for those experiences, both the trials, the tribulations, as well as the successes. Um, but honestly, if there are any takeaways, I think there are a couple elements that I do would say I, that I would encourage us to think about. The first is, I honestly believe that curiosity was the defining thread through every chapter of my experience. I could never go wrong when I leveraged my curiosity. And taking it further, learning how to take calculated risks, initially small risks to talk to someone outside of my ether, um, concerted risks to maybe engage in something that, that was a stretch for the sake of learning and trust building and evidence creating, and then encountering a big fork in the road where I encountered a choice for my career. And this isn't about like shooting in the dark and trying all kinds of things. Usually there's some conviction running in your heart as well, ideally in tune with your dream that you had, that's guiding the choices that you make, guiding the explorations that you're making. So these three elements, curiosity, creative risk, and conviction, have worked tremendously for, for my path. And hopefully you can see how they could play in your path. Because Hopefully this presentation gives you permission to dream again if, you have, if you've stopped dreaming. And revisiting those things that you wrote down, I would highly encourage you putting energy into like internalizing them and spending a little bit of time every week to flush them out. And we're each individuals on this planet. We're each indelible fingerprints that are very important. Each of you should feel like you should have a hand and some license to shape the future that you want. So your dream relates to the necessary inclusion because we need your voice to make our, our future better than what is being perceived in the media around such dystopian sort of outlooks. We can find optimism, hopefully, in our dreams again. So whether your dreams sort of started at a child level, hopefully you're still dreaming and they've only since refined with age, and you're looking forward of the future projection of yourself and being mindful of the journey that you're on, how are you tracking? The, the stuff that you wrote down, how are you tracking along that path? And I would encourage a couple questions that you should ask yourself, like what if, beyond just your future projection, like what future do you optimistically want to see? Ask a what if question around that future that you suppose could be possible. And then, like if you include yourself, which you should, how is your journey going? How are you renewing yourself to better position yourself to have some license? How are you transforming yourself to position yourself to have a hand in shaping that future? Because we need your voice. And it's funny, recently, a friend of mine, a dear friend in LA, her name is Andia Winslow. She's a famous voiceover artist, spokesmodel, advocate for health and wellness. She's got so many talents all in one person. She basically saw some, some of my sketches on Instagram and said, you know what, I want a voiceover to your sketching. Can we do something together? OK, sure. So we started like commiserating. And in the, over the course of what amounted to a weekend's worth of work, we created a video uh, and put it out into the wild with the, with the aim of inspiring people to dream again. So I'll play it for you now. What does it mean to dream? Do we pause to sit still and dream about the right things? Is it about what we like to buy? Is it about wealth? Is it about fame? Have we deeply reflected on what truly benefits us? Self-discovery, love, health, unity, creativity, meaning, purpose, faith, hope, change. What if our technology empowered us to be a better version of ourselves? What if our artifacts amplified human connection? What if our context moved us into flow and self-actualization? What if we owned our story 
and solidified our family and generational stories? What if we scaled down our consumption and celebrated the best of only what we need? What if we freed ourselves to love, create, and help more? How might we begin to work together to create a better future? So I ask you, what is your what if for the future? What is your renewal to help us get there? I love this quote by John in that it's not about making the world more technological. It's like, how do we really humanize? How do we make this stuff more humane to really enrich and help people and unlock their potential? And that's really the message around how important your dreams are to guide your professional convictions. So thank you for listening. Does anyone have a question or want to share their dream? <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering, since you're involved in, or you were involved in so many like technological ventures and so many new inventions, um, and I literally just thought this question like because of that quote, um, how do you deal with, I guess, like the cynical feelings that can come with a lot of technological innovations that like always meant well, and now we see like a lot of technological innovations are being misused and kind of taken over by like nefarious intentions, I guess. Mm. Um, and being someone who has a hand in a lot of in like the starting point of technological innovations, how do you deal with um, like hoping that they're always used for good and but knowing that they might not be like down the line they could be used, misused? Yeah, that's great. It's a great uh, question. Um, yes, there's a lot of evidence already of technology gone bad or technology misplaced and not considered or thoughtful to like, the, the, the needs of not just human beings but also the planet and broader societal implications. I think when those multidisciplinary teams get together, what I have noticed is, again, people don't necessarily know what to ask for from them because they're not used to the collision. And I think it's important for us to show courage in those moments to say, you know what, I could wireframe a, a journey of this experience, but there's an ethical question I've run up against, and I want to propose a new set of sort of, you know, ethical guiding principles that are guiding my wireframes. And I'm going to talk about both the, the, the guiding principles and why and what, you know, feedback and uh, human, humane and ethical implications are guiding those distillations. We're, we're going to spend some time, equal time on that. And oh, by the way, here's the wire that reflects that ethos. And now we're really telling a story based on meaningful evidence. I think where, I, I, where I've seen things continue to go down that, path, that, that previous sort of behavior is when the teams are running so fast they just want to throw one on the wall. And no one feels that they have the license to raise their hand and say, can we just like pause for a moment to talk about this? And it's some of those simple moments where, you know, if, if we seize that opportunity, magic can happen where we actually allow someone to show, like, a better answer that is more thoughtful. So I think it's about evidence building and creating more of it. And in a new multidisciplinary world that we'll continue to find ourselves in more and more is having the courage to say, let's slow down because I'm not comfortable. And no organization worth their salt should ever, like, beat up that person for raising their hand to slow the train down. Hey, Kevin, very inspiring story. Uh, I have a question regarding the fork in the road. I'm actually very uh, inspired to work on my creative projects and uh, uh, start a YouTube channel and do some work around that. But uh, it would take a lot of time, and, and the time right now is going to my day job, which in the Bay Area pays my bills, uh, work at a large <laughs> company. So the question is, how, what advice would you give you know, should I like quit my job and do the creative work, or should I, uh, should I, uh, you know, uh, be at the job but like suffer the drudgery of nine to five? It's a it's an excellent question, and I will say bills are very real. <laughs> um, honestly, though, it's your career at the end of the day. I, I think if I'm honest with myself, when I reflect back, like I was probably and I and I love 
the, the community and culture that was Nike. I, I, I adored it. I adored my time there. But I learned the hard way of how risky it was to just get so wrapped up and enamored in what you know, Nike was wanting to do and asking for in their agenda that I found a little bit of myself getting lost in that fray until I started you know, finding those threads of encouragement to like, follow through and experiment on something. So it's almost like, what little bets can you make? Despite being busy, I mean, I was busy in my day job. It was, it's, we, all, we all have these demands. But carving a little room, it was almost like a couple of pennies in the bucket that you throw in just for yourself to invest, to, to read something, to experiment, to have a conversation with someone, to take a, a weekend to make an experiment, like a YouTube video. You could do that with a couple hundred dollars of equipment and get the thing up and get feedback and resonance. And those little evidence moments are going to inform eventually if you really have a fork in the road. And you know, you use your you know, present employer as a platform, but it's ultimately it's your career. So just you know, think about that license and how you put, make micro investments that leads to something bigger. Uh, microphone's and, coming. And while the microphone's coming, I just want to reinforce like if someone with the things that you wrote down, if someone wants to actually share your dream and how you're thinking about your what if and renewal question and statement, feel free to share in this venue too. We wanted, we wanted to encourage that, so. Kind of to um, add to the first question, um, with these bigger companies like WeWork um, and Facebook with political ads and Google with privacy, like how does one designer push back on that, you know, raising your hand, but you're only one of 100 designers uh, to make sure that we can actually change stuff when it, all the focus is on SoftBank. Mm -hmm. Well, I honestly believe this is one man's opinion, but no matter your environment, no company is perfect, no company will ever be fully perfect, but a leader can come from anywhere. And I think what we need are effective leaders that know how to be the change. So yes, there may be moments where it's intimidating to slow the train down and ask the, the ethical question. Um, there are moments to be by yourself, to, to noodle on something, to create evidence that could move mindsets if you just show it to someone. You know? There are all kinds of ways that we can find uh, the ability to lead something forward and create a, a mini movement, if you will, that can show a solution-oriented tact to addressing the problem or the concern, right? It's one thing to rally and, and theorize and, and soapbox, but uh, we know like, those, those moments might not be as effective, right? Uh, but if you have real evidence, or, or you know, if there's a glaring you know, ill truth, you gotta call those things out for sure and, and say, hey, I'm concerned for the right ethical reasons. Like, you should find that support too, but there's many different ways to lead is all I'm, I guess I'm saying. And sometimes it could be a small bottom-up thing that you do to garner a new story, a new piece of evidence that will change another person's mindset. And now you have an ally, and you can go together to do the next thing, and the next thing, and all of a sudden you have a movement grow. That's, that's the tech that I've seen most effective. Did I answer that question? Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, hi. I was not going to share my dream, but I figure, why not? <laughs> Anyway, um, Jim Crow has killed my community. I mean, it's just set us back generations, and I'd like to go back and actually uh, do some good. Uh, that's the dream. But my actual question is, um, it helps me to understand something if I can categorize it, if I can categorize it and uh, see how it relates to other things. So uh, the kind of design work that you're doing, what job title is that? And if you could name some of your competitors to help me relate it to, to everything else, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's, um, I, I would best characterize it. I think it's an excellent question. Like, what is the, the act that was represented here? It's very much, and we didn't know what to call it, call it honestly, as we were moving. Like, my title changed probably 10 times in the story of the scale up of BCG DV. But honestly, what we were doing was problem solving at a peer-to-peer -peer level, no matter who was in the room. If it was a CEO, business person, engineer, you know, um, technologist, we just tried to problem solve and use our deep faculties to evoke a new story, a new system, 
and try to get buy-in and alignment or question and challenge each other to make a better answer. So the problem solving came at a breadth per perspective in that we were bringing others in. And it, you, you tend to then say that that's strategy work in a sense. And it's funny, my cohort was called strategic design for that reason because we were, we were sparring at a strategic level. But then there were times where you had to go deep and actually build something or flesh something out and use your deep expertise. And usually, if I, look up, if I reflect back on the strategic design cohort, every designer on that team, usually they had one to three deep weapons that you could hang your hat on those skills better than anyone. You could trust that they would deliver, no question. It wasn't about being a generalist and being all things to everyone. We asked each designer to, to bring a couple deep strengths to the party so that the evidence, the work, catapulted everyone forward too. So it made the problem solving better every time we got together as a team, but we knew to disband the team and let people do their individual head down work to flesh things out as well. And you know, using other industries, as you mentioned, other adjacent topics and categories and best practices, Getting outside of our own realities was also important. That's why, I'm not making a plug, but that's why I leaned, I leaned heavily on the Design Management Institute during the scale up of that incubator work because I knew we didn't have all the answers ourselves. I could talk to the chief design officer of Pepsi, for example, who's on the board of DMI, and he could express realities that are helpful for my situation and vice versa. So that was a, it was a very important to plug into a community outside of myself in the problem solving. Thank you, Kevin. Um, can you share a little bit more about like, the habits or how you organize yourself uh, to do creative work, considering that all the instructions, at the, <laughs> how busy you are? Um, yeah, definitely right now with my young company, it's you know, holding up about 10, 20 spinning plates. Um, but honestly, one thing that I've, I, I think the, the, the biggest and most important rubric that comes to mind is sort of that intersection between urgency and importance. If you were to map that on a two by two, like what region do you want to live in? And in an organization, startup, or large enterprise, all kinds of competing demands, it's really easy to fall into a place of, uh, I think it's wasteful to live in a place where it's like, not important stuff, but it's like seemingly urgent to everyone and you gotta do all these things and you're not being effective on anything. So I tend to align my, my calories toward those highly important things to drive success for my clients as well as my business uh, and learning how to go slow on some of those things and saying no to the, a lot of other stuff that's claiming to be urgent but not necessarily as important. Some of that stuff you have to do, but making sure that you're conscious to balance the time and energy, right? And for the type of work that I wanna have, sometimes it takes getting ahead of an immediate like client relationship or whatever and actually creating evidence. I mean, something as simple as a video, again, took a weekend of work, but folks have leaned in to say, yeah, I actually like those values and that ethos. How can I get some of that in my company? Like those are the conversations that putting a little experiment out in the wild will have for, for you and your teams. Another one. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, um, once you're at a startup and you get a seat at the table, because it can take some time, right? Um, what are some practical tips that you have to maintaining that seat at the table? What are the first few things that you would do um, to make sure that you're actually, you know, mm. taking advantage of that. Great question. So how do you how do you sort of assert and keep your place at the table? Basically, you know, it's funny when I was learning how to be an engineer, right? Um, when I remember one of the college professors saying, you know what, <laughs> regardless of all these calculations that we're doing, when you're out in the workforce, if you want to drive any influence at all, just know that 70% of your time will be spent communicating. <laughs> And it's so true, and especially if you're trying to problem solve at that peer-to-peer -peer level to shape the evolution of a business, communication is huge. And so I think a lot about the hierarchy of how I present things or the hierarchy of like, in, in the heat of team problem solving, 
there's probably a couple convictions that I'll feel in that meeting, and I make sure I get those <laughs> things out of my soul <laughs> onto the table for a consideration. When you feel those moments of conviction, because again, it's all about communicating, and it's, it's one thing to be a, a voice in the room, but you need to be an effective and relevant voice in the room. And convictions, I, I believe, are your best guide. Evidence is your best guide. Uh, the, the, the true question, the, the, the valid question that should be asked, whether it's ethics, whether it's you know, any, anything that's relevant to that team to move it forward, act on those convictions and communicate with focus and a hierarchy where you're not just like drowning someone in all the details, because they probably don't care about all the details and all the time that you spend to work on that thing. But just knowing how to be decisive with how you communicate, I think, is critical. Come on, anyone want to share their what if or renewal stories? Right here. Here you go. <laughs> I have another question. Oh. So, okay. I, mean, I don't know how if I can, amazing talk. I was captivated, by the way. But I have a question about so I work in data and AI analytics, and it's extremely confusing for me hmm. because I'm a newer designer. I come in with a fresher take, and we're designing applications, but I'm coming in with a designer that has had 25 years in the industry, and he hmm. comes from an older generation. How can I, I noticed you were talking about bringing something, especially in the medical field, to a newer generation, and it takes a long time. How can I, as a newer designer, and I'm the only one, mm -hmm. I don't have any other help. How can I communicate effectively to them, this is what I think we should do, mm -hmm. whether it be evidence-based or research-based, mm -hmm. um, just, I just want to know any valid tips or validation for bringing things a little bit quicker and more relevant and modern for today for people to understand, especially when it comes to mobile applications and medical, mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals, exactly. Yep, yep. Oh, I mean, so is that a question? No, no, it's good. Um, I, I, mean, I draw from that question the fact that, you, you know, sometimes it, you probably, and correct me if I'm mischaracterizing it, but it feels lonely sometimes to be that only person in that legacy situation, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's very important at a couple dimensions like to, to plug into, there's other designers that are facing similar challenges just like you, that you gotta find, find those communities, and they could sit in adjacent industries or other communities that you can find online or at conferences, but find those like for like people. Be a voracious learner around like, the market friction isn't going anywhere, as, as smart as people are, the market friction is still real. So as, as, as much of a self-study as you can be around the realities of that patient, I'm making it up, I don't know your problem, but the patient or whatever the context is around that patient and taking some experimental stabs to like characterize it from a design, your design perspective of what you see, what information you collect and wrestling with that and, and using your community to bounce best practices, you can come more informed to the party and say, you know what, this is actually industry benchmarked or market facing realities that I'm finding. What do you think? And you're being solution oriented you know, versus feeling like, and you're leveraging your, your newness as a, as a weapon to go find and go seek when that person, that other person, and I, I don't mean to like misjudge them, but they might rest in their laurels about what they know over the last 25 years. You, use your newness as an advantage to go find. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Thank you. Sure. So my question is more about your journey. Um, it sounds like you know you went to two different grad schools, and as somebody that's like considering going to grad school or just trying to get the experience in the industry, yeah. would you say that going getting formal education was uh, necessary? Yeah, it's a very delicate question because I never want to, you know, say anything that would inform someone to make the wrong choice. But what I would say is there's, there was a couple paradigms that I was facing when I was considering going to business school and even, let alone the design school in that like the days of the stepping stone progression because other people were doing it and you almost feel sometimes that you have to do it because your peer group has done it. The days of the stepping stone progression is dead in my opinion. And my, I've had mentors like shake me and tell me that. So you never wanna go just because you think you have to for the sake of your career trajectory. But the bigger question is, based on your dreams, based on your curiosities, is the education gonna help you get to where you're trying to go? And can it be an accelerant? Where you, you know, I was in that situation where it was either 10 years 
or two years. And two years to have more license to entertain bigger problems than just sneakers, or 10 years to sort of map myself to the present status quo. So what does it mean for you? Like, it, you should only go if it truly is going to empower you toward accelerating toward that future vision that you've projected of yourself. That's when it, you say, you know, the experiments, the learnings, the investigations feel like it's right to go. It's expensive. <laughs> so even more important that you go through that due diligence. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. Hi. Uh, great talk, by the, by the way. Um, I just want to share my dream with you Please. and actually ask you something really quick. Um, so my dream is to use design to create a more, more accessible world. Uh, and I want to ask you what your dream is, if you can share with us. <laughs> uh, that's a beautiful dream. I, I like the notion of accessible because as we know, there's a lot of institutional paradigms at play where not everyone has license to play, to even follow through on their dream, right? We sort of have to navigate life knowing those realities and, and uh, operate with gratitude and compassion and be generous of what we have and share it. So for me, I think <laughs> these crazy vacillations that I've had, I feel like I'm finding the right place that's going to probably define the rest of my career. But there's bigger questions, topic areas, where I, I don't think the things that we're leveraging right now are helping us unlock our true human potential. So I want to see, my dream is to see a future where we celebrate human connection again. And do we need to even go to a primitive place to understand like what family means, what passing down legacy means, what owning the stories and the bonds mean, developing community? like when. You know, I, I go home to my neighborhood, everyone's garages go up, the cars go in, and that's it. There's no interaction, right? Th that's the, the future that I want to see, an inclusive, diverse, equal access. I'm with you. But ensuring that we're celebrating what makes us human again, and we're still very far from that you know, vision. Good question. And thank you for sharing a dream. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Kevin. That was amazing. It was wonderful. <laughs>